Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage The Vault Series. Today's clip is another from an interview we did with Steve Warner. Steve talks about how he got discovered, actually by Dottie West, and she asked him to be in her band, which brought him to Nashville and led to him getting signed to RCA Records with Chad Atkins. Hope you enjoy it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Once again, my good friend, Steve Warner. But I never lose the fact that I started out playing bass for Dottie West and Bob Loom in some of the greatest years of my life with, with the great Bob Loom. And I mean, I played almost three years with him. And, you know, and I, and I was so proud that I followed in the footsteps of James Burton and Joe Osborne, who mm -hmm. played, both played in Bob Loom's band, you know. So mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I was in a band. I wasn't with them, but I was in the same band with those guys. Mm -hmm. And Bob Loom was tremendous. So I wouldn't so, trade anything for that. There was a club on the west side of Indianapolis, the Nashville Country Club. And... I'd been playing there with uh, quite a bit through uh, like my junior year of high school with uh, my buddies Daryl and Larry Young, brothers from Kentucky, and uh, they started bringing in some acts from uh, uh, Nashville acts, you know, country acts. And they had a bunch of cool people that I'd go down and a lot of nights I'd be playing there. I was kind of on and off. I'd play with them some nights, some nights not. But so anyway, my buddies called and they said Dottie West is booked in here. You got to come down. And they had a and they were, they were, I remember them saying this. They said, she's got a young steel player in her band that's awesome named Paul Franklin, and you got to come down and check them out. And I love Dottie in, anyway. I've always loved her music. And so I went down, and they got me up, and I sat in and played and uh, played op in front of Dottie. Well, I heard a, a girl's voice sing, and this was before her show even started. And so I look out, and I was singing a song. They had me sing a couple tunes. I was playing bass and singing, and... I looked over on the stage and Dottie West is out on stage with me singing harmony with me no on an kidding. old Buck Owens song. And I was like, oh my God, you know. She's, her, they haven't even done her show and she came out to sing, you know, and I was knocked out. And the whole crowd came down and started gathering So what around. year would this have been? This would have been, uh, <clears throat> I was a senior by now. I was just, 71? I, I just started. 72? No, I was, no, it was about early 73 because mm -hmm. I was just starting my senior year of high school. Mm -hmm. And so... The crowd started gathering around the stage. It was a raised stage about four feet tall or so. And everybody saw Dottie out there, and they're coming and gathering around. And so then she goes, do some more. So we sang together again and some country stuff and stuff that everybody knew. And to me, a long story short, after the show, after her show, she invited me to set in on her show, too. I got up and played with her. And, and so after the show, she asked me, she goes, she goes, uh, we want to talk to you out on the bus. He goes, come out if you can. And uh, I was, like I say, a senior in high school. So I go out on the bus, and her and her fiancé, uh, the drummer, Byron, mm -hmm. and her band, they were, they were all sitting around, and we're talking. And, and she says, you know, our bass player is getting ready to leave. His wife's having a baby, and he's already gave his notice, and he's going to be leaving soon. And we'd like for you to join our band and come with us. And I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, I was thrilled. That's exactly what I wanted to do because mm -hmm. I told – People, when I was 12, I, when yeah. I get old enough, I'm moving to Nashville. I, yeah. I, everybody's like, yeah, right. But so I knew that I, this is that's what I wanted to do. So my first trip with Dottie was to Reno, Nevada. Which took, oh, man. I mean, it was my first bus ride, you know. <laughs> After a day of traveling, I'm going like, well, we got to be getting there. And they go, no, no, we're not even to Oklahoma yet. You know, it's like, oh, geez, my first bus ride is two days, you know. But we stopped in Amarillo, Texas, and picked up uh, some folks that were going to be the opening act and were... Uh, also uh, sang backup for Dottie's. We were at a hotel in, in Reno, mm -hmm. and it was the Gatlins. That's, oh, that was yeah. who we picked up in Amarillo on the way, and that's the first time I met Larry and Rudy and Steve and LaDonna. And uh, Larry, Dottie had been working with Larry, and she's the one that really brought him to Nashville, so he wasn't even here yet, you know. So that's cool. They were, I was amazed Larry was singing all the songs. And So and now what were the, <coughs> they, uh, they were your opening they were they, they opened the show for Dottie. They actually did like a 30-minute opening set. And Were they doing original material? Yeah, they were doing a lot of a lot of original Gatlin stuff. Any and, of the stuff that later became Yeah, hits? they did a bunch of stuff that were later hits and stuff, and it was awesome. I mean, I was sat out in the audience every night. It was like Harmony was spectacular, and just, you know, Larry did a bunch of stuff he'd just written every night, you know. I did a year, about a year and a half of doing the Opry with Dottie. My first year and a half was at the Ryman. And, I'm, you know, you can't even believe how, unless you've been backstage and seen all that, how that was, how they've added on to it now, and it's mm -hmm. packed now. But can you imagine the Opry going on, and there's people, you know. Well, they filling out in the, in the alley and all that. Oh, huh? yeah. It was, they didn't even, it busted out of the place. It was so packed, crowded and packed. And, you know, my first time in there, I'd never even been there. And I was with Dottie West. She was late getting there. 
I ran in. They were introducing her as we pulled in the side parking lot, and I grabbed my bass out of the trunk and ran in, and never even been. I was hallucinating. I was so <laughs> freaked out, you know. I ran past Minnie Pearl and little Jimmy Dickens and and uh, Roy Acuff, and and they were on top of each other because there was no. There was dressing rooms, but there was 30 people in a dressing room. There were people changing and women and men, and it was just, man, it was fantastic. And I was running in like, where do I put this, you know? Where, I don't know where to plug in. I've never been here ever, you know? And that was my first time on the Opry, and it was the Ryman. We, you know, they moved about a year and a half after I was with Dottie. They yeah. moved out to the new place. And but they used to go out, and the guy, that's where Hank went across the alley, oh, went into yeah, the Tootsies. Tootsies. I was, I've been, you know, that's what I'm saying. I'm so glad I had a chance. I, I've been over to Tootsies. We'd go over there and hang out. Just a place to get away from, right. you know, wait your next show. And it was all out in the alley. And it just, and I was like, man, I've heard about this stuff for years, people talking about it. And the crowds were lined up down around, all the way down Broadway. People lined up to get in the opera at the Ryman, you know. It's fantastic. I mean, it was just a little slice of history. Do you remember black and white or color? Does that it, make sense I to remember you? it in black and white. I swear I do. It's funny you say that. Maybe it's just the time has gone by, but it really it feels that way. And I remember, I remember almost hitting my head when I walked out. There was a balcony that hanged down right there. I remember I almost ran over. Marty Robbins was like right here. And I was like, oh, my God, you know. And, there was, and as I turned around, there's a balcony that I almost, in my memory, it almost, it almost bangs your forehead. It's so low. It's yeah. right there. To go out through it, through the backstage, you almost have to duck. And, and I remember there was people sitting like right. You could reach out and shake their hand there or that right there. You know, that, it's no longer like that, but it's still got that close feel. But, and then it was, a, it was certainly geared around the radio show. I mean, there was so much stuff, chaos, you know, wonderful chaos going on stage people coming and going, upright bases everywhere, and st lap steals, and yeah, it's great. Yeah, it all started man. to sell insurance. It's, I know. it. Life and casualty, you know. I was with Dottie for uh, three years. I stayed with her for three years, and uh, and at that time, I got to, I played on some of her records. I sang and played and met, you know, I met Jerry Bradley and a lot of the people. Mm -hmm. I really, at that point, had started writing. I started writing for Dottie's company, uh, First Generation, which was a part of Combine. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, I always loved that fact too. The writing part intrigued me. They had, uh, Combine was where Chris Christopherson wrote there and Larry mm -hmm. Gatlin. And, well, Larry wrote for First Generation as I did. And mm -hmm. she signed me to a writer's contract. And that's what I was, I, I shifted my gears a little bit and had really was honing and trying to be a songwriter as much as anything else at that point. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really had intentions to, I'd, was be honest, I was kind of, we worked so many dates, I was kind of burnt a little bit on the road and was wanting some time away and really wanted to write. And so I asked Dottie uh, about getting off the road and just writing, and of course that's what I did. And I wasn't off the road probably three or four weeks, and I was out the Opry one night, missing it, to be honest with you, a lot. I was out the Opry one night, and we had done some shows over the years, with uh, obviously with so many other artists, and Bob Lumen was one that I, we'd done shows with, and I'd always been friendly with him and talked with him. And, one night at the Opry, uh, Bob came up to me and just in a frantic and said, I was just out there watching watching the show, and uh, he came up to me just frantic and said, you've got to go to, Steve, you've got to go to Houston with me tonight. He said, we're leaving in a couple of hours. I guess he knew I'd left Dottie. Mm -hmm. and I said, well, Bob, I, I don't have my stuff. I don't know, you know, wh where are you going? And where long? Oh, we're going to Texas. We'll be just gone for the weekend. We're playing Houston and, you know, whatever. I forget, uh, Longview and a couple of dates, you know, two or three dates. And he said, I'm, I'm stuck. I don't have anybody. You got to go. You got to go. And I loved Bob Bloom. And I mean, and I, some of his guys in his band were saying that too. You know, you got to bail us out here. The guy just left. And, and so I, I went. I, I, I love Bob. And I, I hopped on the bus and went. I loved him so much after that weekend. I just, I stayed with him for about two and a half years. And, uh, and I played bass and opened the shows. He, I, with his band, I fronted and I did about three or four songs. And, and uh, Bob would come out. I loved it because it was so different. It was so not structured, and it really made you be on your toes as a player because Bob didn't use set lists. I mean, with Dottie, we knew the show was a set, formulated show. It was a show. You know, mm -hmm. we knew what every point, every point in the show where it was timed and where it was. We knew what was going to happen. With Bob, what I loved about Bob's show. We opened with the Got to Get Back to Norma, and that was it. Everybody was on their own after that. I loved it. So he might do a monologue. He may go in the audience. You never knew. He was a great, great showman. And I can see 
why people loved him so much. You know, the James Burtons and the mm -hmm. Joe Osborns. And he always had good players in his band, and I can see why, because he really... Bob understood that player mentality mm -hmm. too. He loved his players and treated them great, and and uh, it was a. It, you know, did, Conway was good to his man. He, too. he certainly was. Um, it was a. It was a. There was a bond there, and and Bob really understood it. And and uh, boy, we were all for one and one for all. You know, it really was that way. And then Bob, I was with Bob about two and a half years up until my brother played drums with him actually till the Terry up until his death. I was with Bob. Uh, up until he passed away and uh, I was with him through all of his illness I was with him out on the road and the ambulances and all that stuff and it's a whole long story but he got very sick and he was just like a it was like a brother older brother that was very sick you know we were just I, at that point you don't care about the music at all you're just so worried about him you know and he actually he came through okay he had surgery and they worked they worked frantically to get him uh, well and he went through a lot of problems for about a year, and uh, and then he passed away. But in the meantime, Johnny Cash did. He did. Bob got well enough to do an album. He 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 had an album that Johnny Cash produced. His buddy who lived out by him out mm -hmm. there in Hendersonville. He did an album called Alive and Well. Ironically, it was his next to the last album, and I was so thrilled because Bob called me to uh, to play on it, and Bob actually cut some of my songs. Mm -hmm. he, that's the first stuff I ever had cut that oh, I wrote yeah. was Bob Loom and. I'll never, I'll never forget him, if nothing else, for that because mm -hmm. he gave me my first chance as a writer. Did you know Johnny Cash before that? No, I, no, we played. Farron Young used to have a club down on Lower Broad, and we played one night working up some of the songs. And we, here comes the Cash entourage, mm -hmm. and Cash got up on stage with us and played. And he did just suck the air out of a room. Oh my goodness, in, no he? question about it. When he walked in, everybody just went, you know, it just stopped. And anyway, they asked me to play on the album. They cut some of my songs, and I was just scared to death. We did it at House of Cash. Mm -hmm. I had to go in with Bob and play the songs for Johnny Cash sitting there. And I was thinking, yeah, he's going to love these songs, you know. Mm -hmm. And I got done, and he would say, yeah, let's do it. I love it. Let's cut it, you know. And it's, God, you know, and I'm going to play on it, too. Paul Yandel played on that mm -hmm. session. Larry London played drums. Waylon came in and played guitar oh, on a couple yeah. of things. I was, I was in heaven, I mean. 